Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tor, and I'm going to be joined by Abhijit Gole uh, to jointly uh, make this presentation. So we are going to talk about um, so the markets, technology, where do we go from logical block addresses, and touch upon intelligent disks, and quickly talk about uh, a product that we, uh, a technology that we announced uh, earlier this week. So you, you would all have seen this picture. There's a huge uh, growth in data. Um, IDC has predicted that the market will grow from anywhere from 11, um, sorry, 1.1 zettabytes to something like 11 zettabytes in the enterprises. The, the person who talked before me said that, I mean, anyone can predict a number, but every, you know, most of us are going to be wrong. <clears throat> it's very hard to project what that number is going to be, but all it could be is it's in order of magnitude uh, you know, greater than what we can ever think of this data size going to be. Now, this is a huge opportunity for guys like us. You know, we get to sell a lot of storage. But while we do that, we also see a uh, few challenges that perhaps could, you know, um, inhibit or that could cause challenges in delivering a solution to this marketplace. The, the first challenge we see is if you look at the IT spending growth, the IT spending growth has pretty much have been flat or projected to be flat the next few years. So we are going down from anywhere from 6.5% all the way to 2% year-over-year growth uh, in terms of ID spending. So the storage spending has been, uh, you know, has had its ups and downs, but we see the storage spending also pretty much being, uh, being flat. So we have this data explosion, and then we have this uh, challenge in terms of uh, keeping the cost low. The second challenge that we see is that if you, if you look at the HDD capacity trend, between 1997 to 2007, we saw the capacity grow from anywhere from 20 gigabytes all the way to 1.5 terabytes. So that's an order of magnitude 100x growth in terms of capacity. Now we take the, the you know, plot the same thing over a 10 year period starting from 2007, 2008, all the way to 2017 or 2018, we see the capacity growing from 1.5 terabytes to we, we are in, in 2015, we are at about eight terabytes and we see this number getting to something like 12, perhaps 15 by 2018. So if you look at it from a capacity growth, that's like 10 X. So what does that tell us? The, 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 the key information here is that the, the, the dollar per gigabyte drop in terms of pricing from you know, 97 to 2008 was significant, but we, see this, we don't see the same trend continuing. So we have this huge data explosion. We have IT spending sort of remaining flat, and then we see the disk drive technology is growing, but not at the pace at which we want it to grow to get better economies. And the other challenge that we see is also the, from a media standpoint, the disk is going from uh, you know, the, the, the traditional uh, uh, parallel uh, magneto drive to we are going to shingled magneto recording, which, which causes or which brings its own challenges, which means these, the old software stack uh, should change as well to take advantage of, of this technology. And the last thing we see is from a, from a workload standpoint, we have had, you know, the traditional workloads so far being deployed in the enterprises. And if you look at the traditional workloads, typically leverage block or a, or a file infrastructure. As we go forward with some of the emerging applications, we see the trend is a little bit changing where the emerging applications tend to deploy a new kind of storage infrastructure, which is driven by object storage. So we are moving from something like a scale-up infrastructures uh, for the classic applications, and we are moving to a new kind of storage infrastructure with the scale-out architectures. So with the, with the data explosion happening, with the IT spending being flat, and um, you know, the, um, the, do the dollar per gigabyte trend uh, is, is coming down, but not as significantly as it used to be, a new kind of uh, applications emerging. Um, the question is, can traditional storage, uh, can, can, they, can, can it address these challenges? So with that, I'll hand it, hand it over to Abhijit. So good morning, my, my name is Abhijit Gole, and I'm going to attempt uh, to make a case for more intelligent storage. So I'm going to begin with this uh, conjecture 
that storage devices are evolving. But if you look at the disk drive, it's difficult to tell what exactly is evolving. Certainly, they've been growing in capacity by leaps and bounds over the past few years. But apart from that, what they do has not seen much change. So possibly similar to evolution of life, this change in the pace of uh, evolution of disk technology is uh, imperceptibly slow. And that's why it's very difficult to tell what's actually changing. But if you look carefully in a logical sense, you might be able to discern at least two eras of disk uh, storage evolution. So now bear with me. I'm going to stretch this metaphor a little bit. Uh, so for life, there was an early era. That's when multicellular life uh, started on, on the planet. That was about 500 million years ago. Most of that life began in the oceans, and the diversity of life was kind of limited. And the location was fixed. It was limited to the oceans. The early era for disk storage uh, started with a fixed location for data. It used to be identified physically by cylinder, head, and sector. So we may call this the location-centric era. For life, the early era lasted about 250 million years, and then began the middle era of life. So in this era, we saw a lot more diversity in life. Uh, massive reptiles like dinosaurs walked on the planet. And life actually moved from land, uh, sea to land. So it was available in both places. So for this storage, the middle era began with the LBA the logical block address. So fortunately, it didn't take 250 million years. Uh, pace of evolution for disk storage is about 10 million times faster. But the logical block address um, allowed us to let the disk drive decide where to put the data physically on the uh, platter. So we may call this the location agnostic era. So with the introduction of the LBA in the last 25 years or so, disk drives have thrived, and they're available in all sorts of capacities, large and small, different speeds and feeds with hard drive, uh, as well as SSD technologies. So for life, after another 250 million years of the middle era, there was the new era, and that was called the Cenozoic era. This was the age of mammals, and also the age in which intelligent animals like primates and humans evolved. So for this storage, it may be now is the time to you know, create something more intelligent. And this, we may now be at the dawn of a new era for disk storage, which is more of an intelligent era. And we believe with the key value interface, we might be creating something akin to the opposable thumb for the primates. Because just as the primates uh, grew significantly in their intelligence with the opposable thumb, it's possible that the key value interface is endowing the disk drive with a data awareness, which will lead to more intelligent storage. So the question is, why now, and why the key value interface? 
I think right now, there's a confluence of multiple factors that is creating a time for change. Of course, the first factor is Moore's Law. This year is the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law. And as you're well aware, Moore's Law has led to an exponential growth uh, in computing power uh, available for cheap. The second factor is that while Moore's Law has increased the CPU performance, the disk storage performance has not kept pace. And there is a huge gap between the performance of the CPU and performance of storage. Even though the capacity growth has kept pace, performance is still lagging. The third factor is that to keep up this capacity growth, we are inventing new me media technologies, both in magnetic recording as well as in flash. And LBAs are not the most efficient access method for these media technologies. The fourth factor is that as you're getting these bigger and bigger disk drives, the rebuild time for RAID or replication or any of these recovery mechanisms is becoming very, very large. And that is becoming a serious uh, management challenge. And finally, the fifth factor is that this huge explosion in uh, unstructured data is creating a serious challenge for data governance. And any method by which you know, we can classify the data as it gets created will tend to make this issue a little bit easier to deal with. So with these five factors, I think there's enough of a case to you know, create a new approach to this storage. So going back to the Moore's Law, if you look at the impact it has had on the data center versus personal devices, there's a quite different impact. On the data center, we've stayed with sort of a client-server architecture. And there's no significant change there other than making the server CPUs bigger and bigger. Whereas on the personal devices, we are making smaller, faster, thinner, and smarter devices. So it may be time to borrow a page from our friends in the personal device industry and change the architecture of our data centers. So instead of having few large CPUs controlling storage, how about we create lots of low power CPUs and distribute them with storage inside the disk drives? So what does that bring us? What that creates is a match between the compute speed and the storage speed. So we go from having these large CPUs that are uh, very, very fast, but most of the time they spend waiting for the storage, to something that is much better matched, where we have CPUs inside the storage that are not you know, these massive compute resources, and they're not waiting for the disk drive all the time. And I think um, this key value interface is the ideal interface for such intelligent disk storage. One of the main benefits of having this key value interface to storage is what I mentioned earlier, the data awareness. Now you can query the disk drive almost like a database. And that can have very powerful ramifications. So to summarize, what are we getting from these kinds of new storage devices? Of course, we are getting a lot of compute efficiency because now we, are, we don't have these big 
servers or big compute uh, CPUs waiting for storage. The second is we are enabling the transition to these new media technologies, which are not optimal for LBA. We are enabling faster recovery from disk errors and failures, because instead of having to you know, do RAID or replication of the whole disk drive, we are able to do granular uh, recovery from you know, lost objects, which is a much more faster and fine-grained way to recover from errors. And then finally, with the query capability and metadata that's associated with the key value interface, we may be able to enable much better data governance because as, as you create the data, it already, the disk drive already knows what type of data it is. So with that, I want to introduce um, the technology that Toshiba announced this week. We are calling it the key value drive. And it's the industry's first integrated compute, uh, high performance SSD and HDD storage combined in a single 3.5 inch form factor. So with this device, we can actually not only provide uh, a key value interface, but we can actually run applications on the drive itself. So you can imagine sometime in the future, data analytics being run on the drive itself. So you don't have to pull the data out of the drive to process it. The drive is already aware of what's stored in there, and you can process that da data. Somebody earlier mentioned uh, the problem of data gravity, and that is exactly what gets addressed by putting intelligence in the drive. We are actually demoing this technology in our booth today. Uh, we've been demoing it for the past week. Um, what we are demoing is actually a chassis containing uh, 12 of these drives. Eight of them are running uh, a Ceph cluster inside a 1U rack, uh, 1U enclosure. And that Ceph cluster uh, is being used as a block storage device using RBD. And we are, we are actually demoing a Windows VM running off that RBD. And we have a PowerPoint presentation running in that VM. But we are also showing uh, a performance demo uh, that shows the performance of this kind of a drive. So if you haven't done so already, please visit our booth and check this technology out for yourself. And thank you. And I'll take any questions you may have. Okay. Could you please come to the mic? Uh, thanks for the session. And sure. uh, yeah, the question is, uh, can this particular thing will be made available to the public uh, cloud vendors like AWS or Microsoft, or how does, uh, you know, because I think since the world is moving towards that, where do you see this, you know, being used in a big way or the right way? You know? Certainly, I think it would, we would want it to be used everywhere. <laughs> and I think with things like IoT and much larger volumes of data uh, foreseen, I think it makes sense to use this kind of drive going forward. As I mentioned, we think eventually this is the direction storage should head. We just announced this technology uh, this week. So yeah, so we'd be talking to quite a few customers and you know, public cloud vendors could be sort of one of the potential targets to talk about this particular drive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you mentioned integrated compute capability in the drives themselves. Uh, what is the runtime in the, what kind, uh, how do I need to encapsulate my program so that I can run it on the drive? It is actually running Linux. Okay. So as long as you can run on Linux, okay. I think is it, it should uh, be able 64 bit ARM or? It's, it is a 64 bit processor. ARM, I guess. 
Um, we are not revealing that right now. Oh, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, are you releasing an SDK for that now? Not yet. Not yet, but yes, that's part of our plan. Sometime in the future, we would be doing that as well. Okay. And the drives you're releasing now, are, are you releasing a full portfolio now, including SSDs and hard drives, or only the hard drives? So the, the current the drive that you, that, that's being demonstrated yeah. in our booth currently has uh, two 2.5-inch hard drives integrated, and, and the capacity could be, you know, today, the max, uh, max capacity that you want to have on a drive is about three terabytes, and that has a roadmap, uh, Toshiba, that grows from three to whatever the next logical number is. So you can see that as an evolution where we would be taking some of those existing 2.5-inch drive technologies onto this, onto this drive. On the, in terms of uh, SSDs, we do have uh, two M.2 um, SSDs on this drive. Um, so the, the M.2 SSD is primarily used for you know, metadata, and the, we have two of those so that you know, we can have a copy or a mirrored copy of the metadata on the other drive. Whatever is the balance capacity that's available on the SSDs, that could be used for read caching as well. And it has a 64-bit, four-core CPU integrated. So uh, did I get this correctly? So in a 3.5-inch form factor, mm -hmm. you have two 2.5-inch drives, two M2 uh, SSDs, and a processor? Correct. OK. It's in our booth. You can it's, it starts to make more sense now. OK. Uh, <laughs> so uh, are you, um, would you say this is a, a micro server? Well, I mean, the, the, the Connotation with microserver is that it, it kind of feels that you can run any application, including traditional business applications as well. And we have sort of stayed away from that positioning. What, what essentially you can use these drives are for running any storage software, right? So today we are running Ceph, right? We can run uh, Swift. We can run any kind of um, storage software on this drive. So the, the thought process is that having these as intelligent drives would allow us to run other applications like Hadoop, perhaps, that supports a key value interface. So anything that supports key value, you can run that application on the, on the device. Okay. But if you're looking at general purpose compute, this is not it. That's our positioning. But the industry, the market can use it well, any which way it wants. Right? So you I mentioned know. Hadoop, and I think it's a good idea anyway, uh, if it has enough compute capacity in there. The compute capacity is a 1 gig, 4 core, 64 bit processor running a Debian Linux on it. OK, good. thanks. Thank you. So this product is in a way unique, but I have to ask, how does it differentiate itself against your competitors in the market like the Seagate Kinetic? So the question is, how do we differentiate this product against uh, our competition? Um, so we're not going to talk about our competition. We can, I can tell you what is that we have done this, what, what we have different. done differently here. Right? Um, so the one, the, the approach we have made is that we, we looked at the complete market and we saw there are opportunities that, that's there in the, uh, you know, the cold data, archival tier, where certain products makes more sense. And we thought there is an opportunity in the middle, which is, you know, there is high performance market that is going gravitating towards SSDs. And there is this low cost capacity tier that is going towards near line hard drives and, and technologies like you know, Ethernet drives. So there is a middle market which is looking for where you need performance, you need capacity, but not, you're not willing to spend that much of dollars in terms of acquiring SSDs. And that's where we think this product fits. That's, that's one, one target market that we see. The other thing that we see is that uh, you know, as the unstructured market or unstructured data market explodes in the, in the enterprises, one storage that is going to become common is object storage. Object storage in terms of footprint is going to be a lot more larger than the, than the block or the files uh, infrastructure that you see in enterprises. So our thought process was if we, you know, if we deliver an object storage solution and then if you allow a little bit of a processing power so that you can run some block and file system software on top of it, so the enterprises have the opportunity to take advantage of the low-cost object storage infrastructure to build the you know, block and file um, infrastructures on top of that so that there is some cost optimizations because one of the trends that we see is that the budgets are not growing and we are not, the drive prices are coming down but not as fast as we want it to be. So we, we see there's an, there's an opportunity there. And that's where we thought we want to build a product and that's where we wanted to go. And that's, 
that's a reflection here in terms of this key value drive solution. What kind of performance can I expect from those drives? So the question is, what's the performance on these drives? Um, uh, you can we can visit our booth and we can we can demonstrate to you from from a, in a 4K, 64K, one megabyte iOS, what kind of throughput you can see. So today with a one megabyte throughput, we are demonstrating about uh, 110 megabytes on these drives. And and the, the nice thing about the key value drives is also you're not no longer a block device, so you can go down to like eight bytes and see what, it, what kind of IOPS you can generate. So we do about uh, 10,000 to 11,000 IOPS with a, with an eight byte IO size. And it's, it's running live in our booth, so please do come to our booth. And how much would they scale when you add more of those drives? Well, where is the limit of the scaling? These are, these are Ethernet drives. So we, the current chassis that we are using is, is, a, is a 1U 12 drive chassis. So we can have 12 of these drives and you can stack them up. And they are independent. So your performance is not, uh, you're not ganging these drives to get performance. Each drive can deliver whatever the capacity it is. Yeah, and the, scale, the scaling is not dependent on the drive itself. It's on the so software that may run on the drive or on top of the drives. So that has the, a scaling. The interconnect is Ethernet, right? That's yes. correct. So we're pretty limited by Ethernet, by the network. So if I look at... If, if uh, we're using Swift or, or Seth or something like that. So right, you, but in the case of Swift, you know, you have the client that is sending data to the drives, but it can send data to as many drives as Swift can support, yeah. right? So the same limit as Swift, okay. Thank you. And, and then from an Ethernet infrastructure standpoint, the, the chassis that we see, depending on the workloads that you go after, right? So there are chassis that gives you um, sort of, um, you know, you have 40 gig on the front and you have about 24 gig inside in terms of, you know, the 12 drives having dual port. Um, so there you are, you are seeing sort of um, one is to one or you know, less than that for all subscription. But if you look at capacity-based infrastructures or you know, you're getting into different workloads, then you can have one is to two, one is to three or subscription on the Ethernet as well, where you can have 20 gigs coming into a box and you could have 60 drives and they're all not performing at the level that you want, but that, if that's what your workload demands are, you should be fine with the infrastructure as well. So we see, I mean, this is a, absolutely, it's a new market. Um, and we are seeing, you know, a lot of um, interest in the in the OEMs and system vendors to build Ethernet chassis. So you are going to see a different, you're going to see new kinds of solutions that are coming out, um, catering to various different workloads in terms of performance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Question. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, yesterday I actually visited your booth and then saw the demo and then it was cool. My quick question about. Um, the cost and the boom perspective. I saw that you display this uh, 48 terabyte. I think it's two U or one U. One yes. U. Yeah, there are four terabyte, so it's a 12 drive there. Um, compared to the cost of boom, w for you to install quad core one gigahertz and then this drive SSD to make it that 48 terabyte versus let's say you have commodity hard drive, 48 terabyte, and then buy the commodity Intel Geom based server with 32 gigabyte DRAM. Do you, do you really think uh, you can beat the price? So I think it's an exercise that you should do yourself. We've done it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I don't know your expectation about your cost type, right? So that's oh, yeah. why I'm asking. So. Understood. So, so the, the question is, uh, you know, what is the TCO on the Right, price? right, right. So, yes, we have done that work um, mm -hmm. ourselves. And what it points to is that. It's to an extent workload dependent, right? So today, the, there, are, there are two challenges that we are trying to address. So the one, one challenge is, let's say you, you take a Xeon box, you throw in 60 drives, okay? Um, you're going to, yeah, the dollar per gigabyte on that box is going to be pretty low. And we mm -hmm. think we can address that price point. Now, if you go from 60 to, let's say, 80 or under drives, okay? Then this could be a little bit skewed to, because it depends on what's the number you're looking at, what okay. IOs, what throughput you're looking at. Now, the biggest question that we have is that the one thing that we talked about is the failure domain, right? So with a 60 drive on one server, if you don't care, I mean, if you don't care about the data that is residing on that and you lose that box and you're okay, that's fine, okay? Because 
it, it, the moment you have object storage, you're looking at three replicas. Now one replica is gone. Uh, what are you going to do about it? So you're going to try to rebalance it. And if you're rebalancing, what's the impact to your performance and how much of you know, loss of performance that you can have? So that's a fundamental question we want to answer. And if, if, if that, you know, in that answer to that question is like, it's okay, I can deal with that performance, then, then you're looking for a really cost optimized uh, solution which is driven towards capacity. But if you're looking at a different kind of a failure domain, your data is important, then uh, you know, we, we make a lot more sense. And, and that gives you, a, a better, with that feature, you can pay premium in terms of dollar per gigabyte to us. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Thinking about how to put uh, this, this kind of technology into the context of a, a, a large-scale storage environment, um, it, it seems like it's almost, it's like it's well overdue somebody did something like this. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, is um, you know, there are a bunch of details and there's a whole bunch of inertia in the industry uh, towards block storage and towards RAID and towards things that people understand for doing resilience. And um, I, I guess the question I have for you guys is, is how prepared are you for, the, um, for, for, for answering the arguments that are going to come and, and be pushed against you from all sides in trying to get this kind of thing adopted? I mean, I, I think <laughs> that, that's why the analogy to evolution, right? right. It's inevitable. It will yeah. happen. Absolutely. It may take some time. Absolutely. But. And I mean, some of the things, like, for example, the argument here where you have, like, you, you, you didn't use exactly these words, but it's like you said when, a, when, you, you, when you, an object's not there, it's not a system failure, it's a cache miss. That's kind of like the, the, the analogy that, that I think is really appropriate yeah, and, there. And, 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 but that implies a higher level um, uh, scheme for you know, integrating each device into an overall resilient platform, right. and that, and that, and have you, have you, have you got that story straight yet? Do you think it's definitely something that uh, we are aware of, and we're working towards uh, resolving, right? But this is what scale out uh, object storage is all about, right? It needs now to be aware of devices like these, and take advantage of, you know, the intelligence that can reside there. From our side, we are trying to work with all of the ISPs and the ecosystem partners to you know, want to share with them what is that we have and how, we can, how they can build a, you know, a better infrastructure and you know, work with them in order to get this out to the market at some point in time. <laughs> Do you think that if you had an existing Ceph cluster, you could just start adding some of these nodes on the end of it and kind of incorporate it into the same cluster? Is that, I'm mean, just thinking about the migration path, if this looked like a good idea for the future. Well, technically, maybe possible, but uh, chances are that, you know, we, the version of Ceph that may run on the drives optimally yeah. might be different. Okay. But yeah, if, if you run the same version on the, on the drive, yeah, maybe you could. Okay. But if you want it optimal, you're probably going to run a different version of Ceph. So this is a question about integration with Ceph. You said that you can run Ceph on your disk. In Ceph, we have two options that are journaling and caching, and they take advantage of SSD. So are you doing some kind of special customization to run Ceph on your disk, or how did you deal with this performance issue that we usually have in Ceph? Um, good question. Yes, uh, I think we are looking at a modified or a new version of Ceph that will use this key value interface. And we are aware that the Ceph community is working on a new uh, storage backend that is taking advantage of this kinetic protocol and things like that. And that will be the version that will be better suited to work on our drive because it will use our key value 
software that's running on the drive that optimally uses both the uh, spinning media as well as the uh, flash. So to add um, on top of what uh, Abhijit just mentioned, the, the kinetic APIs that we support, we, we support both on inside the drive and outside the drive. So what I mean by that is you can have a SF cluster that's outside talking kinetic APIs to the drive. It doesn't have to run, the OSDs doesn't have to be inside the drive. It can be outside and still can talk to the drives using kinetic APIs. And the other option is running the OSD on the drive, and then there's no change. It still, talks, still the same, talking. talks the same kinetic yeah. APIs. So if I run the OSD on top of the drive, I don't need to take into account all the resources that Ceph is usually consuming. For sure. instance, That's one it. of the problems that I have when I do the sizing for Ceph is that I need to keep in mind that I need one CPU per OSD, and also I need to have at least one gigabyte of RAM per tera, at least. So those kind of resources yeah. are the ones that I'm a, saving. And you yes. need a SSD for journaling, right? We have all of that covered inside, yeah, yes. It's all, it's all covered. Great, thanks. Any more questions? Are there any other use cases for this disk drive or is it just customized for Ceph or is it just one of the initial so, implementations? So the yeah. question is, are there any other use cases? Um, the, the reason, the reason we decided to announce this as a technology and not as a product at this point is to kind of put it out there. And we, you know, we have some ideas where we want it to go. And that's one of the reasons we are, we are doing Ceph OSD demos on this. And we think, you know, you know, Hadoop with key value could take advantage of this. But we really don't know beyond that where, you know, what the market is and how it could be deployed. And this probably is the best place for us to come and talk about this technology and see how the developers can take this forward. Uh, into newer application areas that we haven't thought about. Yes. I just want to confirm my understanding of, from architecture standpoint, this is one of those hard drives is need one network address, assuming it's IP address. And it has only a uh, capability of throughput about 10 megabytes per second, and has limited capacity of what's today's size of the biggest hard drive? Four, four terabytes, six terabytes? Yeah, it can be, it's for, what we are demonstrating today is four terabytes, and it could be six, it could be eight in the future, yes. So these are the, the drive can do today, right? Yeah. Correct, but each drive, the, the architect, from an architecture standpoint is, uh, you know, the, the, the front end is the Ethernet network, whereas the Ethernet network can deliver with a one gigabit in interface, we can get about 115 megabytes or so, and we, from an architecture standpoint, we have matched that. In order to meet the Ethernet, uh, you know, throughput ca capability, we have had two hard drives, right, plus then SSD and compute in order to saturate that wire. And we have dual ported, that means I can do, um, while I'm handling some of the front end data, I can also do peer to peer to peer and I can move data through the back end as well. So we have tried to architect it to make sure that we saturate the gigabit ethernet wire as much as possible. So yeah, all the speeds and feeds are so kind of matched. So in, in other words, for any workload which we need very larger data throughput, they have to break down to the pieces to each of the IP addresses. Correct. And because we are Ethernet, you know, you, you, we, nothing limits. I mean, this technology right now, what we announced, right, we are not, it's not a product, it's a technology. So you can think of this as going from 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit to 25, 40, under what have you in the future, right? So it's, a, it's basically taking advantage of Ethernet and you're putting together an infrastructure that can saturate the back end and the front end and make sure they are balanced. That's what so for these kind of hard drives, IP based, what other storage services that drive can provide the application to, like encryptions, like We can what do all of that, do? yes. We have, you know, when we went about designing this product itself, we looked at, uh, you know, some of those requirements, like en encryption being one, compression being another. Um, so we sort of made sure that there is enough processing power for all of those that doesn't impact uh, whatever you see. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's going to be under the hoods, and there is no, it's, there is no impact to the performance. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think we are running short of time, um, so we are, you know, we'll be at the booth and we can definitely, please come by and we can definitely talk. Kyoko, you're ready to run the Apple? Can I just introduce people that came in that I missed? So before we do the raffle, is there anybody who needs a ticket still? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> 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 <laughs>